Methyl red is an azo dye, meaning it has a nitrogen-nitrogen double bond in its structure. Surprisingly, there's more to this molecule than just dyeing clothing. Instead of the free acid structure shown on the previous page, I have the sodium salt in stock. As you can see, the dry powder is an orangey-brown color. To produce the sodium salt, the carboxylic acid is deprotonated, leaving a negative charge. If this is done with sodium hydroxide, the sodium ions take up residence instead of the hydrogen. The protonated dye is insoluble in water, but will react and dissolve in a sodium hydroxide solution. To use the free acid, it has to be dissolved in alcohol or any number of organic solvents. The color changes, which I'll demonstrate in a minute, fall in the weaker acid range of 4.4 to 6.2 with an equivalence point at 5.1. At the equivalence point, half the methyl red molecules are red and the other half are yellow, giving the appearance of an orange color. The sodium salt dissolves quite easily in distilled water, and like any dye going into solution, it's a spectacular sight. As it dissolves, the solution takes on an orange color that borders on red. I almost hate to stir it. Oh, okay, fine. I have a 0.04% solution in stock already, and I thought about getting rid of it when I was cleaning out the storage room. It's got a bunch of junk floating around in there. At first, I thought it was growing mold, but it looks like some of the dye came out of solution and clumped up. Side by side, the fresh solution is a bit lighter. Maybe my stock solution is just too concentrated. But I thoroughly disagree with one description of the shelf life that suggests the color fades over time. My bigger issue is the junk. The color's fine. Okay, enough about all that. I have here three out-of-focus test tubes, each containing 10 milliliters of distilled water. To each, I'm adding a pipette full of the freshly prepared methyl red solution. It's about a milliliter and a half. And now that I've got the focus adjusted, I'll add a few drops of one molar hydrochloric acid to the first one. This is when methyl red earns its name. I'm going to leave the middle one untreated. The one on the right is getting roughly the same amount of one molar sodium hydroxide. The color change is pretty hard to detect, but there is definitely a lightening. The next step is to add 10 milliliters of petroleum ether to each of the three test tubes. Petroleum ether isn't chemically an ether. It's mainly a mixture of hexanes, cyclohexane, and naphtha, which itself is a mixture of all kinds of stuff. Where water is very polar, petroleum ether is very nonpolar. Methyl red is somewhat soluble in nonpolar solvents, so giving these test tubes a good shake ought to extract some of the dye into the organic layer. I'll start with the untreated one to see how much of the dye tends to migrate when it's just water versus petroleum ether. Make sure the cap's on tight there. Petroleum ether is pretty volatile, so I'm actually a little bit nervous to take the stopper out in case too much pressure built up. It's fine though. So there is some yellow color that moved to the organic layer. The water droplets are stuck on the wall in the upper layer, and they're clearly more strongly colored. Giving the tube with the sodium hydroxide in it a good shake surprised me a little. I'm still careful with that stopper too. There's actually no dye extraction into the organic layer at all. I wasn't expecting that, and so I shook it again, just in case I did something wrong the first time. Though, I don't know how you can do that wrong. Still no extraction. 
I certainly was not expecting that, but I might be able to explain it after thinking about it for a while. Okay, last one. I'm happy to report that I managed to get through this whole experiment without losing a stopper during shaking. That's a common rookie mistake, so I guess I finally graduated. Took long enough. In the acid tube, there's actually quite a lot of dye extracted through the organic layer. But notice it's not red. The acidic environment doesn't migrate to the petroleum ether, only the dye does, so it remains a very strong yellow color. So why might all of this be? And why didn't the dye extract in the sodium hydroxide tube? The paper I read for this experiment suggested that there should be dye migration to each of the samples. They were a little more precise about the pH of each test tube, though. They used a buffer. Since I used straight up strong acid and strong base, my results varied a bit more. My guess is that the higher the pH, the dye molecule is attracted to more polar environments, while at lower pHs, there's still a preference to polar environments, but the affinity is less, allowing more to be extracted to the organic layer. On the intro slide, I mentioned that one of the uses for methyl red under investigation is its ability to enhance the sonochemical breakdown of chlorinated hydrocarbons. Sonochemistry is the use of ultrasonic waves to get a reaction to go. The trouble is trying to fit a few thousand cubic yards of contaminated soil into 20 liter ultrasonic baths. What's interesting about this is that methyl red itself, as an azo dye, is considered a pollutant. It's often a contaminant in runoff from textile dyeing plants, so I found several methods to get rid of it. If there was a way to combine these methods, two pollutants could be dealt with for the price of one. In the meantime, though, there are a few chemical ways to remove methyl red from wastewater. It seems like the cheapest way is to use activated charcoal. The first test tube I prepared, I added some larger granules of activated carbon. This trick is often used in organic chemistry as a crude purification step to remove byproducts before recrystallization or other refinement steps. The second tube is a special charcoal called decolorizing carbon. The name is rather suggestive of its intended purpose. This is what's normally used in organic chemistry instead of the big chunks in the first tube. Why? Because this fine powder has loads of surface area and is far more efficient per volume used. I wanted to compare the two because the finer powder can be a real pain to filter out. In another paper I found, they made use of a chemical called chloramine T to oxidize the dye and thereby decolorize it. I don't have any of that, so I'm just going to test what happens when I add an insanely strong oxidizer. Normally, I would have gone to 35% hydrogen peroxide, but after I did that ferroin video, I'm opting for nitric acid instead. And instead of 6 molar, I'm going for the concentrated 15.8 molar stuff. I don't add much, but it turns out to be a very interesting reaction. I left all of them sit for about two hours so the carbon could settle out, and during that time the nitric acid tube did some interesting things. By the time I came back, I had added a control tube in the number two position, which remained untreated for comparison. The decolorizing carbon was the clear winner, the activated charcoal and the nitric acid lightened the methyl red, but not much. The bright red color that initially appeared with the acid slowly faded to this orange color, and there was some sort of red precipitate at the bottom. Then I got distracted and ended up not cleaning up right away. For a week. I was going to say I planned it that way, but I didn't. It worked out, though. Given some extra time, the activated charcoal did a better job. The trouble is that when you're dealing with industrial quantities of wastewater, a week is far too long for mediocre water treatment. The powdered decolorizing carbon still wins. As for the nitric acid, it's just too hazardous and there's an insoluble byproduct. Another interesting observation, I didn't dump the beaker with the freshly prepared solution either. And in a week, left uncovered, 
it did grow the same junk. In the future, I'm going to prepare the solution as needed. So just for good measure, the stock solution is history too. Cleaning out the storage room continues. There were a few things left I wasn't able to get to, and I have plenty of methyl red left, so maybe someday we'll see it again. But for now, the next challenge is going to be... There's always more than one every single time. Lead nitrate. Well, there you have it. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.